Hey, comic book friends, welcome back to Comic Book Corner 2.0. And guys, of course, you're with me, Mike Spider Slayer, and you're getting ready to embark in another countdown. That's right, everyone. This is uh, countdown number 23, I think. Uh, this week we had a total of 10 books that I uh, counted down all together, and we're going to start all the way from the worst and make our way to the best. Uh, guys, a lot of videos lately have been in the house just because it is so hot outside. I can't stand being in my garage. It's just like dripping sweat. So uh, that's why you don't see the normal background and you just see you know me sitting on the couch chillaxing in the air conditioning. So with that being said, let's just go ahead and jump into the countdown. We're going to start with number 10. What if Avengers vs. X-Men issue number four? Um, when I read this series, the first issue, my jaw was dropped. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. It's so awesome. And this last issue was a disappointment. Um, not because it's a what if tale and it's so far fetched that it would never happen. It doesn't have anything to do with that. The whole aspect of it is that it was rushed. And I actually did a review on it on Dark Avenger Inc. And a lot of people were saying uh, that this was speculated to actually go six issues and not four. So they had to somehow tie in lots of information in the last two issues. And this last issue was rushed. I mean, looking through it, um, just people dying all over the place. Um, and, and just panel dying, not page dying, panel dying. You got three deaths in one page. You got Nova dying, Spider-Man, and Iron Fist dies. You have the Hulk with his goofy looking face, which the artwork I thought was a little bit rushed in this issue. You get Hulk that gets killed. You get Psylocke that gets evaporated. Um, you also get Iron Man and... Captain America and that far panel over here, they get sliced in half. So a lot of deaths happen within a short amount of time. Then all of a sudden they're like, dude, we got to come up with a conclusion. And in the end, we find out that Jean Grey kind of is like the only one left with Wolverine while the Earth is being destroyed from the Phoenix Force and it starts anew. And basically they're the only ones left and they wind up being like an Adam and Eve effect. And they're going to have babies and populate the world with mutants. So I guess that's what it is. But that was my issue with this. It was very rushed. And uh, the artwork was kind of rushed. And they seemed to fit a lot in. I think if they made it two issues more, like half of the original series, this would have been perfect. Because the first two issues were really good. Third issue had lots of dialogue. Like they're trying to fit in all the story. And then in the fourth issue, we're like, we're going to destroy everything and throw in Jean Grey and Wolverine together. That's what the world wanted. So that's all I can say about that. But I give this one like a three out of five. Moving on. Number nine. Uh, the Flash Annual, issue number two. Uh, not that this was bad in any way, um, but... You know, when it comes to annuals, I'm always so shady about it. It's always, I'm always so sketchy and on the fence about buying it. Uh, this wasn't on my pull list this week. Uh, but when I saw the cover, I was just like, you know, maybe I should get it. It's got Hal Jordan on there. And maybe it'll tie into the story some way or not. Or maybe, you know, something like that. And maybe it'll reveal something in the future. But then with the annuals... This is usually what you get out of an annual. You get a story that has nothing to do with the current storyline. Um, you get nothing that hints you to the storyline that's coming up. Um, you just get a story that's basically happened a few years past where Barry Allen and Hal Jordan wind up meeting together. And uh, they team up for the first time and they do this battle and, and things of that nature. But... Um, it, it was okay. It was just a story. And when it comes to these annuals, they charge $4.99 for them. And for $4.99, you want a good story, you know? And I'm not saying that the story was not bad, but, you know, three weeks from now, shit. I'll be honest with you. I read so many comics. Probably next week, I won't even remember what this story was about. Uh, but 
you know, the artwork was pretty good. It was a fun read. I'm not going to deny it of that. It had some good splash pages in there. And then even after this story, it has kind of a like a little backup story in there. Um, but again, it's forgettable. And uh, if you want to purchase this, I would say skip it. It's not worth your uh, hard-earned cash of $4.99. I could have skipped this and bought another trade from something else that I would have enjoyed more. And it would have been a quarter, you know, a quarter less of the price. So, uh, so there you go. I'm going to give this one same thing a three out of five. Number eight, Daredevil, issue number 29. Uh, when it came to Daredevil in this issue, I was like, okay, this is cool. It doesn't compare to that Ikari Bullseye series, uh, but this was like a little, you know, two-issue deal with the Serpent of Society and one of uh, uh, Daredevil's past friends uh, basically gets shot by the serpents of society and everybody's involved. You got all the cops, the judge, the, the bailiffs, everyone's involved in the whole thing. And this guy is kind of like a little bit of a con artist, tries to get money where he can get it. Um, Mark Way does a great job with the book. He always does. The artwork is really nice. Daredevil's like this really mysterious looking creature. The action's always good. The paneling's always good. And there was nothing wrong with this issue. It just didn't compare to past issues, uh, but this is, you know, certain certain panels here wound up standing out where it made you feel like you're really involved, you know, part of the issue of what was going on. But in the end, I wasn't super excited about it. Um, I mean, I liked it, but I was like, okay, well, that's the end of that. And then in the next issue, we find out that Daredevil is going to be teaming up with Silver Surfer. And I was like, okay, that's pretty cool because, you know, I haven't seen Silver Surfer in a while. And I was excited about that. So, and then that's your next issue. So this was good. Um, same thing for me. It was maybe a little bit above average. I'm going to give it a three and a half out of five stars. Uh, fun read. Daredevil is never bad. And, and uh, Mark Way does a fantastic job with this book. He knows how to write the character. He's kind of resurrected this series. Number seven. Batman Incorporated. Issue number 13. The final issue. The cover was weird. It's like you got Batman's chest and then you got Batman's symbol with Batman and then Batman's symbol and then there's a little Batman. This this issue, this series got some weird crap in it. And um, this got number seven on my list just because I found out that it's not – they're having another issue of this. Like it's a special or something like that. And it's got like Batman in Japan in it. And I'm kind of like, I don't want to see Batman Japan anymore. I don't want to see anything with Batman Japan. That may sound cheesy, but uh, it's it's weird. And the artwork in this in this series is just a little weird. It's like everybody looks like babies or something, baby faces. Um, I'm not like a huge fan of the artwork in here. Uh, but this is the climactic conclusion to this series. And in the issue, you find that Batman is with Commissioner Gordon and he's getting, you know, for murder and for a whole bunch of charges. And while he's in the room with Commissioner Gordon being interrogated, uh, he goes and, you know, you relive Batman's final um, actual brawl or battle with Talia al Ghul. And, um, you know, they wind up kissing and making out. And I'm sitting there going, okay, we don't want to do this because. Uh, you're going to have more babies or is this your way of, you know, producing another Robin? So, but they wind up making out on the rooftop while this whole war is going on. And uh, what happens is Bruce winds up getting poisoned after this battle. This was a pretty cool page here. Uh, Bruce winds up getting poisoned because she puts poison in the sword and there's no antidote. He's like basically dying and he gets all cut up. He starts tripping balls here with the freaking lizard and stuff like that. And she's like, oh, you can put in a part of something great. And give me the antidote. Give me what I want, which was the box or whatever it was. And, get, you know, I'll give Spider or Spider-Man, Batman the antidote. And he gets tricked. And uh, let's just say that. Talia Ghoul gets shot in the face and she dies and and uh, this person who what was her name Kathy that's right Kathy winds up shooting her in her face 
and she winds up killing Talia al Ghul, and that ends that. And uh, all of a sudden, someone dropped the charges for Bruce, and he winds up being saved, or not being saved, but being, I guess, not put in jail. And uh, and he wound up at the end where you see Agul in the epilogue, uh, because you, you know this is not going to end in some way. And we wind up seeing that the, I guess, what they called it, the... I don't even remember what they called it. The uh, the restoration pits and the harvest and, and the harvest of Lord Deathman's Lazarus blood continues. So I guess what happens is now we're making the sons of Batman. So there's a whole bunch of little baby baby Robins. So is this going to be future Robin? Uh, one of these babies here again? Are we just redoing everything that we did? I don't know, but it just says Sons of Batman. And there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. There's like 12 little bat. There's 12 little Robins in here. So I, I don't know. But it looks like Al Ghul's basically creating this army and whatnot. So it doesn't look like the end for this. We're going to see this come around uh, again somewhere soon. But... Uh, we'll see where it goes. It was average for me. It was three and a half out of five. It was almost predictable, really. Number six. Batman Annual, issue number two. This would have gotten a higher mark for me if it didn't, if they didn't, and this is everyone's complaint, if they did not promote Zero Year on here. Zero Year, we all know if we read this by now, was one page, okay? Again, an annual. An annual, you pay $4.99 for and you get extra pages, but sometimes the story has nothing to do with what's going on right now, and uh, you get a load of BS. Well, that's what I felt in this particular issue with that one page. You know, you sit there and put zero year on there, and there's one page in here with zero year. I was like, why even show that? Why even try to attempt to put that in there? Um, the story was good enough where we have a new orderly that's involved in Arkham. And uh, Batman is being tested. He's being tested. He's putting put being put to a test where he gets put in a jail cell, and um, he has to try to escape from it. So everybody can make improvements on these cells for the elite villains in in Arkham. Uh, so this orderly gets introduced to all the main villains. Um, like the Riddler and Clayface and all these other characters. And then he gets uh, introduced to the freaky anchorism type of lady, whoever she is. And um, she called this Eric guy to talk to him. And, you know, she's a little freaky. I'm sitting there going, what does this chick look like? I'm like, what is, what is she, you know? And the first, <laughs> the first time I saw her... It, it, she looked like this. I'm like, whoa, step back. This lady is freaky, you know. And I liked her story. I thought it was fun. It was a, you know, current story. It told you what it, she was about. And then it's like, you know, you knew that it was because of Batman. It was the Batman that, you know, Arkham became this. It's not a sanctuary anymore. It become basically a prison, a hell for people. And then she escapes and she kind of wants her revenge on Batman. And, you know, she's got a flashback to the zero year, which is right here, which is one page. I remember the day when I could, I could rip the page out and it would be a more complete book. You know why? Because look, the World of Warcraft's on there. I can, I can just tear it out and then the book is complete and I don't have to do zero year. That's, that's what I would do. I would, I would do it. And then they wouldn't have it. See, look, look. Boom. Complete. There it is. You witnessed it here. The zero year page is right here. World of Warcraft's on the back. I have myself a complete comic book that has nothing to do with zero year anymore. Ah, I'll put a big fat X on it and it won't have zero year. That's all I have to say about that. I don't know. I give it a Almost, it's like it was like a three and a half out of five. It's just an average 
a little bit above average story uh, that had an interest in this particular character. And this pissed me off. I don't like that. That's how you get money from people. Top five. Number five. Venom. Issue number 38. Story was really good here um, in this issue. My problem is, and a lot of people don't agree with me on this, is that they like the artwork and it fits the book. I don't like the artwork in this issue. I feel that it's way too sketchy. I don't mind the colors uh, and the tones of it. However, it's too sketchy. I can't make out certain characters. If you read the last story arc, it has the same type of tones to the book. Um, but you can still make out the characters' faces. Here, I almost couldn't tell that that was Andy here. Um, you're sitting here this, and you're like, almost like, who's that? And that's Katie Kiernan, who's Flash's friend. And when did Venom become people? Like, I don't get that. He was a symbiote. When does he form into people? He's not the chameleon. He's a symbiote. When does he have white? When does he become white flesh like person? I don't, I don't get that. You know, it was the same with the other issue where he formed into a car. How do you form into a car? It has motors and parts and engines. It's a symbiote. It's an alien. Just certain things are so retarded for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. But anyway, um, the issue was nice because we get to see, uh, we get to, oh God, I'm sorry, I lost track of myself. We get to see the character development of Andy and her father, which was, which was cool. Um, and you get to see a little bit more of her, of her life. And then the next thing you see is she leaves because she's watching uh, what was it, the Wheel of Fortune with her dad, and she just got bored. And the next thing you see is, hey, look who makes his appearance. It's Jack or Lantern. And uh, it's like, okay, he's back. Now, again, here's another little issue that I have with this series. Jack or Lantern has been back in this series already a lot. Okay, he's been in many, many issues of this series already, and we're, you know, we're 38 issues into it, but I seem like he's, he's a little bit oversaturated in this series. Uh, but moving forward, um, so what happens is Jack O' Lantern comes through. He's he's finding the girl. Um, next thing you find out is somebody dies. Venom winds up coming in trying to stop Jack O' Lantern. He's freaked out that oh my God, look what happened. Um, you're out from jail, and he's trying to protect his student. Andy is his student in class because he's a PE teacher. And he wraps symbiote around it. And let's just say that we get the birth of our new Venom-like person here. So that was pretty cool. Now, it's a, is it a sidekick? Is it just temporary? Is it just this issue? Is it a couple issues? It's yet to be determined. Uh, but this is, again, this was a pretty good story. I got those couple of nitpicky gripes about the artwork, about the symbiote. Uh, and things of that, but otherwise the story itself was really solid, and I'm going to give it a um, three and a half out of five stars. Number four, Trinity of Sin, Pandora, um, issue number two. Uh, this book was was a, a solid book as well. Lots of dialogue in the book, which I don't mind, but it was forgettable dialogue, if that makes sense. We have the agent, we have Argus and, and, and Shade agents um, here talking about Pandora, witnessing the crater of what happened to Superman when he held the box. Um, we get to see Pandora, uh, get to know, you know, you get to know Pandora more in this issue. She talks with uh, Marcus and things that she has to do in order to get this box open and to get the sins put back in the box. Main characters in this book are Signal Man and Giganta and um, uh, Vandal Savage uh, here. And Vandal Savage, uh, this character right here, he's supposed to be the purest of evil and he's supposed to put all the sins back in the box. Uh, but what happens is, as the issue goes along, we see that Pandora gets in this huge fight with Signal Man, uh, calling the little play-by-play -play shots, being like, she's got a vertebrae broken. He's like some little nerd dude. 
vertebrae broken on the seven cinch tentacle, and uh, she's got an eye pocked out, and uh, she broke her neck, but she's still going, boss, you know, and that's how it reminded me of her, and Gigantus is like, just screw this, he grows big and strong, and just sits there, and, and, and smashes her, but nothing stops her, and the pure objective here of Pandora was to give the box over to Savage, and to sit there and say, you know, you got to open it, I'm giving it to you, and he's like, okay, true that. I'll take the box and I'll open it. And this is what happens right here. And it's like, oh, dude. And same thing that happened to him, or same thing that happened to Superman basically happened to him. He just could not handle it. And then at the end of the issue, we get our uh, agents talking with each other again. And you're kind of like, okay, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and that's it. And that's what happened. I like this one. I, um, I, same thing, three. I think it was a three and a half out of five stars I gave it. I did a full review on Dark Avenger Inc. on this one. Um, I did like the story. Uh, the beginning and the end was a little bit forgettable. I kind of don't care about the agents. I want to learn more about Pandora, what she represents, and who's she going to get to open this box. And I feel like this is more of a little bit of a tie-in to the Trinity War because she's the one that really started everything. Um, you know, she's the worst first one to hand over that box to Superman and created all this sickness and everything else that's going on. So really good issue. Top three, top three, number three, boom, Guardians of the Galaxy issue number five. Uh, first full appearance, I guess you want to say, called with, uh, Angela in the cover, uh, artwork by, um, uh, Sarah Pacelli, who did the Ultimate Spider-Man uh, just a little while back, does the art in this now. And first page you open up to after you get your little brief of what's going on, uh, you get this right here. Bam. Angela. Nice spread page, two-page spread. Uh, really like that page. Uh, just really gets you a feel for what the character is, what she really looks like. So I really got the details there. Um, and basically, the issue it holds true to itself like it's always has. Um, you got Rocket Raccoon with his, you know, personality. Him and Tony getting along, talking over tech stuff. And just to see Tony excited about tech um, that he has not experienced yet was amazing. Because you could see his eyes light up. Um, another great thing about this issue was... Uh, the awkwardness between uh, Gamora and uh, Tony Stark after their like little fling or one night stand or what have you. Uh, you can see the, the anger and the disgust in her face. And Rocket was just like, ah, you know, you shouldn't have done that. And uh, now you got Peter uh, Quill going out on his thing, experiencing something that happened from Age of Ultron. And this is just like I said. Age of Ultron ignites everything in the Marvel Universe now, and now it's just even more heavy. Uh, she, she, he starts talking to people, and uh, um, you see everything that has basically happened to him. You find out that he's lucky to be even alive, not even maybe lucky to be in this universe. Uh, he was really close to losing it uh, altogether. And um, towards the end of this issue... We see that Gamora and Angela do this battle because Angela is an unknown in this universe. She has no file. And they say, well, unless she was born yesterday, we wouldn't, you know, we should have something on her. So right away, Gamora goes all out, gets out in her little costume. They're outside the moon, and a battle erupts between the two. And uh, Gamora has a tough match on her hands. And uh, at the end of this issue, you see Thanos and Peter um, talking about things in general, just about timelines and uh, Age of Ultron and all that nonsense. So uh, really, really good stuff. It, it's going to be interesting to see where this series goes with his father, with the whole events of Age of Ultron, um, with Angela, with Gamora with Tony Stark and there's a lot of unknowns yet to be determined in this series I think now that Angela is inserted I think now we're going to start seeing 
uh, more stories with these with this group and getting the story forward because now about two issues or three issues now the story really hasn't moved forward all that much so we'll see where it goes but I quite enjoyed this issue I'm going to give it a four out of five and our top two books of the week which one gets number one which one gets number two are we ready here we go boom not number two. <laughs> the wake. The wake is number two this week. Um, this book is awesome. It is almost a tie between the Red Lanterns, and I'll tell you why the Red Lanterns got that number one spot a couple minutes here. Uh, the wake continues to be an awesome series. Um, however, I found it a little predictable. Uh, that's the only thing I can really say about this. When I first started reading this, I was like, oh, I can picture this being a thing or a Nightmare on Elm Street type of thing because they were seeing shit while they were dreaming. Uh, but in this issue, this was the issue where all hell breaks out. You know, it's the alien gets out or the, the merman gets out of the cage. The people are fighting for survival while the, while the monster is chasing them and they have to survive. And, and I saw that coming in this series, which doesn't make it unentertaining at all. I thought it was really, really good. Um, and just like the little dream sequences, you find out a little bit more about the merman, about how he he preys his victims. I guess he, he shoots out this, this stuff and it makes people hallucinate and it makes them see good things when he's just about to attack. Ah, he create, you know, he gets you at the last second and then that's when you see him which was pretty interesting uh, because in the opening pages, that's what happens here. We see Dr. Archer who's tripping. She sees her son in the trees and everything. And then at the last moment, you know, you get a friend of hers who's <laughs> like a Robin says, Hey, you got to wake up. And the next thing you see is that's what you see. He's right there just to make his strike. So that's what he does, which I thought was really interesting. Um, another cool thing about this book that's, what part that's unpredictable is is three point billion years ago with in the past with Mars like all this stuff is happening in the past and you can see things in the future and you're just like where is all this tie in into this book right now this is ten parts and we're at the part now where we found the creature the creatures chasing them I know just how Scott Snyder writes that there's no way he's going to drag out seven issues of this monster chasing these people. Uh, we find out what the cry is from the monster, what that noise it was making, and we find out that it's a call to call its other species or its other friends. And basically this is what happens at the end of the book right here. And they're not the only, that's not the only species left of that. So I, I found it very interesting uh, where this went. Just a little bit predictable, but I think you were going to have this in this issue. And now after that, this is over, um, it's going to move into a completely different direction now. I, I, I have a feeling. Where it goes, I'm not sure. It's yet to be determined, but still a really good book. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it. It's almost like a five out of five for me. Just that one little hiccup in there that it was predictable there. All right. And the number one book of the week is Red Lanterns issue number 22. Uh, this was also... Uh, my sleeper pick book on Dark Avenger Inc. as well. Um, I still had other books to read, but I when I got done reading this at that time, I'm like, I'm making this my sleeper pick because this was a really solid issue. And it wasn't – what made this number one this week was not that it was one good issue, which was this one, but the issue before that was really good as well. And I think Guy Gardner's – um, character development as a Red Lantern is is awesome. I think you, you see his demise as a, a Green Lantern where you think he might want to be a Red Lantern. And in this issue, you kind of feel that he was on this saving mission with his new allies, maybe staying true to what how Jordan really wanted him to do was to spy on the Red Lanterns and be part of them. 
But then at the end, we find out that it was one of his comrades' species that wound up being killed, and the rage gets a hold of him, and he winds up killing everybody or the captain on the ship. And at the end of the issue, um, you see that it's like the dark side. Every, t every kill that you do, everything that's negative, the rage consumes you. And he kills this captain at the end of the issue, and we can see that he goes, uh, you know, there's nothing that can help him or save him, and he just winds up zapping him. And at the end of it, it's like, I am the true leader of this Red Lantern, where in the beginning, it felt like he's like, you don't need a leader. We just need to work as a team. He was kind of like, he was kind of just self um, just like himself there a little bit, just saying, hey, let's work together, you know, kind of laid back. But after he killed this guy and he's sitting there just being engulfed in the rage and he's just like nothing for nothing, but he's like, is it me or did that feel absolutely great? And he's got the red eyes and he's got the lava coming out of his mouth. And you just sense pure evil out of this. And then at the end of this issue, uh, we get to see that this might not be the last of Atrocitus. Now, humor is thrown in this book where needed. Uh, it adds a little personality to the book uh, when it came to this guy right here where um, Guy Gardner referenced him as a testicle with teeth. And when I heard that, I was dying. Uh, the artwork in this book is heavy on inks, but after the first issue, I was kind of dogging it. But this issue, it seemed like it fitted a lot more and uh, with the red, and it just, it really, enjoy, I really enjoyed it. And this was fun. Um, you get to see less characters in this book. There's like four or five main characters that they seem to be focusing on. So it's taking a better direction in character development, and, and including Guy himself, because he's growing as a, this Red Lantern leader. And where this book goes is I'm not sure because. It's like, is he going to become that true Red Lantern leader? Or is he going to go back to the Green Lantern Corps? Is Atro Atrocitus going to sit there and gain his throne back? Are they going to do battle? There's a lot of unknowns left in this series. I'm very interested to see uh, where this goes. So being that this was back-to-back -back issues of, of this solid book, and it looks like it's going to stay true to this, uh, I'm giving it a 5 out of 5, and it's got my pick of the week so you guys you guys tell me what your favorite book of the week was what was your worst book of the week and uh we'll do this all again next week so guys as always thank you for watching comic book corner 2.0 this has been the countdown it's uh episode number 23 i hope and guys as always thank you for watching comic book corner 2.0 and guys until the next comic book review I'll see y'all real soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye.